how many know we all need to learn all the time, right? And uh, being in leadership is just a constant growing and learning. We don't have it all together. Even though we've been in ministry over, you know, 30-something years, almost 40 years, we still learn. And you still have to remind yourself all the time of things that uh, that you've already learned, but because you forget, right? And uh, so this is good. We need one another. We need to build one another up. Um, before I get into my message, I just want to talk about the book table for a minute. Um, Pastor Rick's book here is called The Secret of Kingdom Life. Amazing message. We both have two, uh, we each have a life message, we call them. You know, God always puts some, we teach lots of different things, but God often puts in someone's heart one particular message. It's kind of their signature message. And this is Pastor Rick's, it's on uh, gratitude. Um, as the password, how many have passwords? How many forget passwords? <laughs> I know I do. I have to keep a list of my passwords on my, hidden on my phone because I often forget what they are. And uh, I hate when I have to change a password too because then it gets even more complicated. But um, there's a password into the presence of God and into God showing up in your life. And this book is about that password, which is gratitude having an attitude of gratitude, which actually Pastor Mike touched on as well. And so this is an amazing book. We've had lots of great testimonies of people that have read the book and it literally revolutionized their lives. And I hear him teach this message all the time because wherever we go, the first message he'll speak in a place he goes to the first time is this message. And so I've heard him speak it, I don't know how many times now. And every time it's like, oh yeah, I got to keep, you know, you got to be reminded, right, to do this. It's very easy to fall into grumbling and complaining about life and about things. And that closes off heaven. And so that book's about that. This book is also for, uh, for sale. It's 101 Reasons to Live a Cross-Centered Life. And I'm going to be talking about the cross because I have to. It's just, <laughs> I can't get away from it. God always brings me back to that. Uh, but it's always a little different. And, um, but this is a, it's not necessarily a devotional, but it can be used as a devotional because each chapter is very short, like a devotional. And, um, and you'll know why when, I, when you hear the message, why this is so important. And uh, so this is also for sale. But we also, like I have learned this, when people come into a church, um, and, you know, a lot of times you have people come in the church and they're all excited. They might get saved. And, and, and then over time, they kind of fall away. How many have had that experience as leaders? And usually it's because they move from the foundation of the cross. And I believe our most important job is to pe keep people on the foundation. Because if they stay on the foundation, they stay with the Lord. And they, they, they stay in the church because it will adjust their lives according to the principles God wants them to live. And so we really focus on, on the cross in our church. A lot of churches are moving away from the cross. They're moving away from the foundation of the cross because they want to please people rather than God, and they are, they're teaching a, a, a different message. And really, that, that happened, there's that deception, and there is a deception that we can all fall into when we move away from our foundation. And, you know, in the Garden of Eden, God had two trees right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life. And as long as they ate from the tree of life, they were good. You know, everything was good. But as soon as they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and how did they come to eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil? Through deception. Through deception. And so every one of us can be deceived. And the reason we can be deceived is because tr we want truth that we want, not what is. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> we want the truth we want rather than the truth that is. And Jesus said he came to reveal truth. That's why he came. And so we have to understand that. So to me, to live a cross-centered life isn't an option. It's not an option. It's an absolute necessity for us to walk out in victory in our lives and stay true to the gospel and the mandate God's put on our lives. So... Um, this book actually retails at twenty dollars, nineteen ninety-five. I'm selling it for fifteen, but we just picked up a thousand of them because the publisher happens to be in Belleville. And so, if anybody wants to buy a case, there's sixty-four books in a case. Um, 
I'm selling at the case for $450, which is just over $7 a book. So you can sell them for whatever you want in your church if you want. And I'm just offering that because we, we got a lot right here, here now. <laughs> and uh, we don't normally do that. But, f you know, just f in the beginning, because this book just came out a few weeks ago, that we are offering that deal. We won't always be offering it. Uh, but uh, it is a really good deal. And, um, and so I... I find it, like, in our church, I want every person to read this book and read the book on the cross because, to me, that's foundational. And people come into church, and they never really often get that foundation in their lives, and therefore they don't last because they don't understand it. And that's the other reason I love encounters so much because encounters are all about the cross. And so what I'm going to share today, so that's that's my, pardon? Yes, 100% of the profits of my books and Pastor Rick's book go to the woman's home that I oversee. We have a woman's home in Windsor. I understand you have here one here also, and that's awesome. And the woman's home is a rehab for women uh, struggling to overcome or wanting to overcome drug and alcohol addiction. And so it's a 20-bed home. It's a 6- to 12-month program that we have. And so all the proceeds from our books... 100% go to that home. And so we, we don't make money on these ourselves. Personally, I've committed, and we've committed our books to uh, be a resource for the home. And so, um, yeah. And then Pastor Ricky has another book he's going to promote, and but I'll let him do that. So it's one he has here. I want to tell you why. In ministry, how many know you go through a lot of stuff? Um, I was sharing uh, with Camilla yesterday how in ministry, you know, we go through betrayal all the time. We go through judgment. I mean, all people do. But when you're a leader, you go through a little bit more because... Um, you know, you're a leader, and, and leaders get judged, right, by people that they lead, and everything you say and do is judged, and sometimes it's, you know, not fair, sometimes it's not right, but we do get judged, and so whenever you go through anything in life that is hurtful or painful, how many know it affects your your heart, you know, and the whole thing God is after is our hearts. That's what he cares about more than anything else. What's going on in our hearts? And, um, you know, deception happens in the heart. Uh, you know, lies happen in the heart. You know, our motives come out of our heart. And whatever our motives are, that's what we do. That's what we act on. So it's really important of what's going on in our heart. But when I was going through many years in ministry, I found that things happened to me that were hurtful, things that really devastated me. And I would push down my feelings and emotions because I wanted to be strong for everybody. I was a faith person, so I wanted to be able to speak my faith and, you know, say and do the right thing. I wanted to love people even if they didn't love me. I wanted to, you know, just be a good leader be strong for everybody and so when I did that though I was pushing down my feelings and my emotions and not allowing myself to feel because if I did allow myself to feel I might kill somebody and uh, you know so or say some things that I would regret and uh, and so but what happened to me and again this is just my testimony over a number of years I stopped feeling altogether like I just was doing things out of duty and and doing things because it was the right thing to do but inside I, things were festering in me where I just didn't allow myself to feel so I lost my passion for God my I still was serving God I didn't want to backslide but I I just didn't have the emotion attached to it and and you know there were times I felt you know obviously joy and and those things but but I could just tell you know things were I wasn't feeling the way I should be and uh, when the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and I'm sharing this story, and I know some of you have heard it, but I think there's a lot here that haven't. Um, when I saw the movie in 2004, The Passion of the Christ, I went to see that movie, and I came home. Pastor Rick was out west, and I came home, and I had a very supernatural experience that revolutionized my life and really launched my whole um, teaching on the cross and what happened was when the movie was going on everybody was crying and sobbing but for me I never cried because part of of not feeling or allowing myself to feel was just suppress my feelings so people were crying around me and I was just watching it and you know kind of taking it in but as soon as I got home and I got in my living room and I was alone I just started sobbing uncontrollably but what happened was I had a vision in my head where I saw a, a big cross and I all of a sudden, the memories of things that I had experienced, negative things that I had experienced throughout my life, started rising up one after the other. And as they rose up, I saw them kind of pass through this cross. And every time they passed through the cross, I, I just a wave of love and joy and peace just flooded me. And it was just amazing. 
And this went on for quite a while. And when it ended, I remember thinking, like, wow, what just happened? That was my first thought. You know, what just happened? And, and I, the next thought I had was, if I had to go through every horrible thing again in my life to experience this, I would do it again in a heartbeat because it was so amazing. And then the third, th third thought I had was the, what do I really know about the cross? Because I was word of faith, which I love the word of faith message. I still love it. Um, however, you know, there you're taught to, rather than fake it, they say faith it, right? <laughs> which is what I've been doing. And uh, being strong, you know, speaking out your faith, having positive confession, and I still agree with all of that. But in the process of doing that, because there wasn't a lot of focus on the cross, see, I found that the the church in general, and I'm talking all Christian churches, uh, some focus too much on the, the suffering death part of the cross and never get to the life. And some just focus on the life. And in the word of faith circle, it was kind of, Jesus isn't on the cross anymore, so don't think about that anymore. Just focus on the resurrection and the life. But you can't separate it. And that's what I've learned. You cannot separate it. It's one event. And every part of it, from the suffering, the death, and Jesus going down to hell and taking the keys of the death, hell, and the grave and conquering, you know, sin, and then the resurrection, all of it is one event. And everything we know about the gospel is wrapped up in that one event. You know, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus that drove him to the cross, led him to go to the cross. And it, it's his spirit that conquered death, hell, and the grave. And it's the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross that, that we're protected and covered by so that we're adopted into the kingdom of God. So it all. So when I say the cross, I'm talking about the whole deal, right? And, and I mean that with all my heart because this is so important that we understand that it is our foundation. It is our compass. It is our place where we have to uh, do life from all the time. And as soon as we move away from the cross we get deceived that's how deception comes but we have to understand that the cross was many things it wasn't just jesus though i don't even want like using the word just it wasn't jesus dying on the cross alone for our sins that wasn't all it was about that was probably the most important part of it but there was so many other parts to the cross that pertain to how we can live this life in victory and how we can overcome and how we can love people and how we can serve god and how we can do the things that god wants us to do because we can't do them in our own strength we can't do them on our own so the cross is a is so much more than our sacrifice because if it was just about the sacrifice of Jesus dying for our sins he could have died the way they uh, offered the sacrifices in the Old Testament in the temple where they would put the the um, the animal on the altar and the high priest would put his hands on the altar and transfer the sins of the nation into that animal and then slit its throat and it would die a very quick, easy death. Jesus could have died that way and been the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world. But he didn't die that way, and he didn't choose to die that way. He cho chose to die one of the most horrific ways anybody could die, with incredible suffering and, and all kinds of elements that really pertain to the things that humans do to one another. And we all have had experiences in our lives of great pain and disappointment and betrayal and shame and sometimes been bullied or beaten or humiliated or falsely accused or all of those things that Jesus went through are things that we do to one another as human beings. So Jesus didn't just take on our sins um, symbolically. He literally experienced the fullness of what sin does to the human heart. He went there to heal our heart and to help us get healing and help in, in whatever we go through in life. Now, Galatians 6.14, and I just give you a little bit of uh, scriptural foundation here. It says, as for me, and this is obviously the Apostle Paul wrote this, he says, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. In other words, the more we focus on the cross, the less appeal the world will have to us. One of the biggest problems, I think, in the North American church is, and, and this is something I struggle with at times, and I know a lot of the church does, is that the, the world has a lot to offer. 
right? And we get easily distracted, and we can easily begin to pursue things in this world and move away from the calling of God or move away from the things God wants us to do because we like the comforts and we like the pleasures and we like the, the stuff that this world offers. And I'm not saying we should never have any, you know, anything at all. We do live in this world. But, but when the world becomes more important to us than building the kingdom of God, we have a problem. And so that can happen very easily to us because we want to embrace, you know, the joys and the fun things in this world. And so, but the more we focus on the cross, the less appeal the word, world has. And then it says, because of the cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. In other words, the world's not going to like you when you focus on the cross because God's kingdom operates the opposite of the world's kingdom. And, and the cross is, is like the ultimate expression of how God's kingdom operates. It's the ultimate expression. Because what is the cross? Laying down your life for others. Right? People live selfishly. We can live selfishly. We can get up every day and be consumed with what we want, what we like, what we have to have, how we feel, and not care at all about others. But when we live a cross-centered life, it will change us to focus on others and laying down our lives. The, wor- the cross is the wisdom of God. It is God's wisdom, and the word tells us that. And it is the way to God, you know, and it is the central message of the word of God. I believe the cross is the tree of life, you know, where we can partake of that and, and have the life of God through the example God set for us. See, the cross is something that happened, but it also speaks all the time. When we read the word of God, the written word of God, it is about the living word of God, right? And who's the living word of God? Jesus Christ. He is the living word of God. That's what the Bible tells us. He is what makes the word of God alive, right? And Jesus, he's the one that went to the cross. He's the one that went through the whole process of suffering and dying and rising from the dead and doing all of that. He did all of that as the living word of God so that we could experience the living word of God in our life, right? And so that's what he wants to do in us. So it is our rock, our refuge, our anchor, our hope, and it's forever speaking out the principles of the kingdom of God and how we're to do life, how we're to live life. You know, you said it uh, a few minutes ago. Most Christians question whether God loves them, whether he really loves them. And they question it because they base the love of God on whatever they're going through and how they're feeling. Or maybe they're focusing on their own failures, their sins, their disappointments. Maybe somebody did something to them. Or maybe, you know, they get into a, a financial crisis or have a physical need. And so all these things happen in our lives. And so when we look at those things that happen to us and we judge God and his love for us based on those things, yet the cross is standing forever in heaven and it continually is saying, I love you this much. And as soon as you turn from the cross, you begin to look at yourself and you begin to look at your circumstance or you look at what other people have or don't have and then you begin to question whether God loves you. So when you live a cross-centered life, you will never question the love of God because it always keeps you anchored in that love and, and all the promises that come with that. And so it is the heart of how we are to live our lives. In other words, the cross wasn't just meant to be Jesus dying for our sins, but it was also meant to show us this is how the kingdom operates. This is how you are to do life. That's why he said we got to take up our cross and follow him. And our cross, you know, some people teach your cross is some, maybe you have an illness or something, that's your cross. That's not your cross. The cross is sacrifice. It's about sacrifice. It's about you laying something down. And so God calls us to lay things down so that others can live. And that's what the cross is really all about. 
and the world doesn't like that. You know, a lot of the world doesn't. But, you know, we have to learn to live that cross-centered life and stay plugged in. See, the cross is, I love this scripture in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 19. It says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know that it is the very power of God. It is the power of God. It gives us the power to do things we are not capable of doing on our own. And, and I love this scripture because it says we who are being saved. And I want to clarify something because there's a, uh, I call it hyper grace message out there. Because there is um, positional truth and then there's, um, what's the other word, Rick? Temporal truth and or truth that's in progress, and, and then positional truth. And there are positional truths God has given us, but then there's that process, because we're still in a time warp. We're still in a time warp. And sometimes people take those positional, those established truths that are true in eternity for us, and make them the reality at this moment, which we're still in the process of. Do you understand what I mean? They're true. They're true that they're done, and they're final, and they're sealed. But we still have a walk to do, right? We still have to go through things. And so the cross is that established. It's established that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's established. It's established that you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that you're victorious, that you're an overcomer. Everything Jesus did, he did, and those things are established. But you know what? We have to take those truths and we have to walk them out right? If we don't take them and walk them out, then we're not going to experience them in this life. And so we need to, we need to do that. So the cross is the power of God. And so if we don't take the cross and we don't apply it to our lives, then we don't have the power of God operating. It's there, it's ours, but we have to do something to apply it. You know, it doesn't just happen. Right? There's something we have to receive. And so the cross is not only the power of God, but it's also the wisdom of God. And it will give us the right insight and judgment for every circumstance in our lives if we seek it and see life through it. So we have to tap into it and let it shape our perspective on everything. See, it has to be our focal point. Or, you know, have you ever gone camping or gone on a hike and you need a compass? Yes. And what happens if you don't have a compass? You know, you don't, you can get lost. You don't know north, south, east, west. You don't know which way to go. A compass will help you get to where you're going. And, and that's what the cross is like. It's our compass. It's, it's our, or have you ever been in a boat and you thought it was moving? And how do you know whether it's moving or not? You look at the land. You look what's, what's solid, what's there, right? And, uh, you know, you, you look at the land and you can see, okay, we're moving or we're not moving because sometimes you can be, there can be another boat passing you that makes you think you're moving, but you're not really moving. And so it's when you look at the land that you see that I'm not moving, you know, or I am moving, whatever way it is, because that land is solid, right? And it's, it's, it's fixed. And the cross is what's fixed. It's unmovable, it's unchanging. It always says the same thing. It's solid truth. We're living in a, in, a, in a culture right now where there is no truth in being embraced. You know, the, 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 you know, society is saying, you know, there's no concrete truth. Everything's relative. Whatever's true to you is okay and all of this stuff. But you know what? If you're, if you're living in a world where there's no solid truth, then you're just whatever comes and goes, you're just all over the place. Jesus came to reveal truth, to establish the truth. And the cross is the truth. And if we don't see it and make it central in our lives, then we're going to be all over the place. And even as leaders, I see people, you know, things come and go in the body of Christ. There's, there's uh, different movements that come and go. You know, there can be prophetic movements. There can be, you know, I don't know, just all different things happen. And, and a lot of those things are good. But that you can't move away from the cross. You can't move away from the foundation when you, when you get into some of the things that happen. And some people do, and they fall apart. And so we have to understand that Jesus, we were dead in our sins. And this is, this is essential. One of the biggest reasons why people aren't getting saved, and, uh, and, and Camelia was, and I were talking about this yesterday, is because people 
they're being taught a false message. They're being taught, this is new people that come into a church and they're being said, you know, just say this prayer and you're going to go to heaven. Nothing said about you're a sinner and you need to repent and turn from your sin. Right? Until you recognize your sinful nature and that you need a savior because you are not right and are willing to turn from sin, you're not truly getting born again. I believe a lot of people in the church are not really saved because they have no conviction whatsoever about sin. I remember when I gave my heart to the Lord, the very first thing the Holy Spirit did was begin to convict me of sin in my life. Nobody even had to tell me. I knew this was wrong. I knew this was wrong. I didn't hear it from a preacher. I didn't hear it from anybody but the Holy Spirit. And so now when people are sitting there and saying, well, that's okay if I, you know, shack up with somebody and it's okay if I, you know, have an affair. It's okay if I do drugs or do this and that. And there's no conviction. And I question whether they have the Spirit of God on the inside of them. Because if the Spirit of God is living on the inside of them, God hates sin. And that's what the cross shows us. Because the cross shows us the wrath of God and the love of God at the same time. Because his wrath was poured out on the sin that was put on Jesus at the same time as the love of God was demonstrated through Jesus to us. And so that wrath was there because God hates sin that much. He hates it enough to send his son to die to take it so that we could live. And if that doesn't it show how much he hates sin. So he's not, uh, his spirit is not saying, oh, well, you know, it's okay if you do that. No, it's not. That's part of the deception because we've moved from the cross. And when I say we, I'm talking about some people. But we need to understand that cross, cross reveals the, the wrath of God. And we need, to see, we need to see life through the perspective of what was accomplished at the cross. And it has to be every day of our lives. And if we don't do that, then we're going to be deceived. We're going to get off. And uh, God had to pay a penalty for sin because of, he is a just God. The Bible says justice and righteousness are the foundation of his throne. And if he did not pay for sin, if sin was not punished and paid for, he would not be a just God. And if he's not a just God, then he's not who he says he is. I remember reading a quote in a book, and I actually put this in my book on the cross, and it's from William P. Farley, and he wrote a book called Outrageous Mercy. And he said this, and I love this quote. It says, God, God's justice is inflexible. It is mandatory. Were he ever to relax his standards, he would cease to be God and the universe would implode. God is absolute in his righteousness and in his holiness. And you have to remember, we were created in the beginning like him. In his image and likeness. Meaning we were totally righteous, totally holy, without sin. And so until we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, sin wasn't in us. But as soon as we ate from that, man fell. And we all know the story. I don't have to tell you guys. But we have to understand the purpose of the cross was to bring us back to the place we were created in the first place. We're being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, his son. In other words, God's goal, his purpose, his reason is to work out in us his holiness and his righteousness. Not just in that positional place, but in our walk with God. That he will continue to conform us into what we were created to be as his children. And so we need to realize that. See, God's number one priority in us is working out our character, meaning making us like Christ. That's what working out our character is. Having, being people of integrity, people that are honest, people that hate sin, hate the sin in ourselves. And it'll be a process till we shed this flesh. I'm not, you know, we're not ever going to be until we, our flesh is always in opposition to the cross, that fallen nature. It's always there. We're still living with that. That's why positionally we're free from it. But literally, at, here at this time, we're still dealing with it. 
your flesh still rises up every day the second you open your eyes. And as soon as you start making decisions, right, your flesh is speaking loud and clear. And sometimes we obey the flesh. And, you know, sometimes we follow the spirit. But I guarantee every day we do a bit of both. Maybe some days we do all the flesh. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, we make decisions, you know, because we're still battle. We're in that battle. But Jesus conquered our flesh. And the more we believe that and the more we pursue the cross, the more we pursue him, the less the flesh will get an advantage over us. Because God is good. He's, per he's merciful. He's kind. He's love. He's all the things, um, all the things that the word says he is. And we need to fear God in a healthy way. And one scripture that I really love, and that's in Hebrews 1. I'm going to just go there. Hebrews 1 verse 3. And um, because again, when I read the word, when I read the Old Covenant and the Old Testaments, and I, I read things about God and his character, and how do we know who God is? See, it's foundational, foundation number one about the cross that it teaches, the most important lesson that the cross teaches us. Most important is what I'm going to read right now. Uh, Hebrews 1.3, it says, The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God expresses the very character of God. The big question that the world has is, who is God? Is there a God? And if there is, who is he? Right? Everybody worships a God. It could be the God of the self. It can be animals. We go to India a lot, and, and over there, people worship animals. You know, it can be a, a false god. So who is God is the big question. The cross reveals to us exactly who God is and what his character is, what he is like. See, I can't trust a person unless I know their character. You know, just like if I go get a loan uh, out or, uh, you know, want to rent something, I have to give them character references. I have to give them referrals. They want to check me out. They want to, you know, we drove a van here that belongs to our woman's home because we had to pick up all the books. And, uh, and so I leased that van in my name for the woman's home. And so when I went to get the lease, they had to, they had to know all this information about me. And they came back, and they had my name when I was married before. They had my maiden name. They had every name I have. You know, they had all this stuff. They had all this information. They, they came back, and they, and they knew all this stuff about me. Why would they go to all that trouble? All I wanted to do was lease a van. Because they wanted to know my history. Because my history reveals whether I'm trustworthy or not right? And so the world operates in that principle. Like if you want to look, borrow money, they want to know, are you going to pay it back? And they judge that based on what you've done in the past. See, God's character was revealed in the heart of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And he said he revealed God exactly. So how do I know I can trust God I can trust God because his character has proven itself through what he did on the cross. It's proven itself. And so it's easy to trust God. So if I live a cross-centered life, then when I'm going through stuff in my life, it's easy to trust God because I'm confident that he loves me. I'm confident that he won't stop at anything to help me. I, I'm confident of who he is and what his character is and whether he's trustworthy or not. And so that makes it easy. And, and uh, it makes it easy to be able to cast my care on him, to be able to surrender to him, to be able to obey him, to do the things. Because I know he's for me and he's not against me. And the cross proved that, ultimately, so that I could walk in victory and not be defeated in any part of my life. And so as you go through, there's so much I can tell you about the cross, and I, that's why I wrote the one book I had on it, which we sold out yesterday. But the new book is a devotional that will help a lot because we need this in our life. If we don't have that foundation, if we're not literally keeping our lives centered on the cross, we're going to go all over the place, and we're so subject to being... Um, deceived and and just getting the cross takes away our excuses i want to i only have a couple minutes i just was given the five minute notice here by my husband and uh 
But just, you know, the cross, the cross helps heal you. I talked in the beginning about my testimony of how I would stuff my feelings down and how I had that vision and how things in my life, when I went through the cross, I had overwhelming peace and love. And one of the biggest things, I'll just deal with one, but Jesus went through betrayal. He went through uh, shame. He went through being beaten and humiliated and uh, falsely accused and lied about all this stuff. He went through everything. And the worst ultimate thing was that he was declared innocent in a trial, but given the death sentence, which means injustice. And you know what? We live in an unjust world. We go through life sometimes and we think, God's not fair. Have you ever thought that? God's not fair. He's not fair because I was born here and they were born there. They look like that. I look like this. You know, they, they have this talent and I, I, I don't. Or they have money and I don't. Or, you know, they, we always are comparing ourselves with one another. And we're always coming up feeling like we've got the short end of the stick or there's something wrong. Maybe we have a physical disability or a mental disability or, or there's something in our lives that we feel it's not fair that we got stuck with this. It's not fair that my parents got divorced and I was abused as a child. It's not fair that I was raised in the foster care system. It's not fair that this happened to me or that happened to me. And we go through life with this uh, sense of, of injustice that we've been dealt a bad deal. And we allow those beliefs to shape what we believe about ourselves. Jesus was dealt a bad deal. Probably the worst ever. Well, it was the worst ever because he was perfect. He deserved no bad thing. And what happened to him was not fair. It was not just. It was not right. But he bore that injustice for all the un unjust things we will go through because of humans and what we do to one another. The judgments we put on one another, the value systems we put in place that leave some people feeling left out or not accepted. And, and you know, all of those things, Jesus went through, he went there. But what we're supposed to do is think of, and it tells us this in Hebrews 1 verse 3, or sorry, Hebrews 12 verse 3, it tells us, think of all the hostility that he endured when he went to the cross. Think about it. We're supposed to think about what he went through. I've chosen to think about what he went through all the time, especially when I'm going through something in my life that makes me feel like I'm getting, I'm being hurt or ripped off or misjudged or whatever. And so when I think about what he went through, and then I talk to him about it, he brings the healing. And he gives me peace. And he shows me resurrection is on the other side of this. <laughs> when you trust me, I've conquered this for you. I went there so that you can overcome this. I went there to show you that there's a better day ahead for you. Because the Bible also says in Hebrews 12, verse 3 and 4 in there, um, it says that he, when he went through all the things he went to, it says he was looking what lay before him, the joy that lay before him. And that's how he was able to go through the cross. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews that it was the joy set before him, that he endured the cross, that he endured the shame, and the joy set before him was seeing us in the kingdom of God, worshiping him, seeing the kingdom of God being built on the earth, seeing the kingdom of God being established. And so what happens if we're not looking to him, and if we're not looking to what he went through on the cross, then we're going to be all stuck in our hurts and our pain and our disappointments and our injustices and our betrayals and all of those things are going to be lodged in our hearts and they're going to continue to rip us off of what God has for us. So God has called us. He gave us the cross. It's the power of God to deliver us in our hearts from all of the pain and the things that are set to, to rob us of peace and joy. And so God went there so that we could have victory. Amen? That's what it's all about. That's what the cross is all about. It's our greatest weapon. Because it's where our faith needs to be, where our salvation needs to be, where our hope needs to be, where our, you know, our future, everything is there. And if we move from it, we're getting off and we're looking to other things. Amen? So let's all stand up.
Yes, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. That's what it says in Hebrews 12. The first few verses are powerful. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you're raising up a church. You're raising up leaders, Lord God, that will stay on the foundation, that we will not be moved by what life circumstances are, what people say, what being politically correct says, what, what, how people feel, all of those things. Lord, we need to keep our focus on you. And I pray, Lord, that every person here will choose the way of the cross and recognize that it is victorious. It is overcoming. It is powerful. It is able to bring us through to all the promises are yes and amen. And Lord, that you've given us that resurrection life and the ability to overcome our flesh and anything that would try to destroy us. So, Father, I pray that each one of us, Lord God, will make a choice to stay on our foundation and not move from it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, we're going to have a break? Okay. So. so, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that we're here together as fellow ministers. Help us to just fellowship and connect with one another and develop new friendships and relationships with each other. Bless the food and the fellowship time now. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>